We're here again, PBFM. Yes, Shout out to we're Bianca. here again. Shout out to Warren and Alison. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in this afternoon. I hope you're all having a lovely day. We've got Ryan and Alison joining us. Welcome both. Yeah, you're welcome. Us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you for coming in today. All right, and thank you to Ryan for telling me about himself. And he said you're a lovely person. You've got a story that you'd like to share also with us today. Yes, I was uh, pretty excited when he asked me and I thought, yes, I would love to do this and yeah, share with everyone how um, God brought me through a very uh, tough situation that went on for a few years and yes it wasn't easy time it wasn't an easy time but um, God really brought us through and it all started back in 2010 uh, when my husband was taken into prison um, yes he'd molested one of our uh, friend's daughters and when I arrived home from shopping that afternoon, there were 10 policemen in my house and uh, they'd had, uh, yes, they arrested him when he walked in a bit later and read out the allegations that sent me into shock, really. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And but then I, I said to him, I said, is this true, David? And he said, no, I wouldn't do this. And that's where, wow, I thought, well, I wonder who's got it right. But it's interesting because I did go into shock because even after he'd been, like we went to the police station with a lawyer and then went back home and it was like it hadn't kind of sunk in. And I said to my son, We'll just um, pack everything up because the police had gone through all, all my belongings in, the, in my bedroom, which they had to do. And I said, we'll just tidy up and we'll go to bed. Your dad will be home tomorrow. And it was interesting. It was almost like a, when someone dies, we go into that denial. We go in shock, denial. And it was, David was taken into custody and he was, in the remand centre for a year and then he spent some time another year and nine months down at Mount Gambier prison where they have um, men who uh, committed these crimes and that's when it really hit me when we got the computer back the night that I went and picked the computer up from the police station uh, the constable took me in and he said we found so much on the computer and he told me exactly what had happened and that's where it really sunk in and that was four months later where it really sunk in in April because January was when he was taken in and I remember driving home that night in the car and just screaming and real anger came out then so it was the next step in the process of grief the anger came out but it's interesting because God soon gave me the peace that I needed because when I got home, it was like that hadn't happened in the car. I walked in and said hi to my son and just chatting and watched a movie and I felt fine because God just took over. His spirit just took over. And I can see now why he, why God uh, led me to really study his word the years leading up to that time in 2010, I thought, oh, I seem to be growing more as a Christian than I ever had. And I can see that he was preparing me for what was to come. Because in 2007, I really learned how much God loved me through a course called Search for Life. It's run at the Life World Centre at Enfield Baptist Church and a few other churches run it now. That's where I did mine. And it was the first time that I recognised how much God really loved me. And from there, my uh, relationship with God grew. And so when my husband had done this, this act and let, that led him into prison, 
I was strong enough to say, this is something that my husband has done. It's nothing what I've done. I do not need to wear the shame of this. Even though some people might have tried to put shame on me, I held my head high, knowing that it wasn't my act, it was his act. And one of my pastors said, Alison, I can see that you're very strong in your faith. And through that first year, because I still had mortgages, I had a, ho a holiday home down at Gawa and the house here in Adelaide. I was paying two mortgages, only doing two night shifts at the Royal Adelaide as a nurse. And I thought, how am I doing this? And one night it just came to me, God, you're doing this. You're doing this. I, I don't know how, but you're doing this. And people in the church, some would just hand a $100 or $50 bill to me at the time, or they'd bring food around and different things like that. And yeah, so that was helping us to, uh, to live without me having to go out to work any more than I was because of the uh, grief that I was feeling. I wasn't able to do any more work. I said, I cannot do another night shift or another day shift. I cannot do another shift. I need to just work these two nights. And God really provided because I look at the nurses that I worked with, a friend who I knew from youth group days, and he'd let me talk and another a Korean nurse who gave me the Shack book to read, which told of the life of um, told about how God is with us through our grief and he helps us to work through the anger and through all those emotions that we feel and how he's able to help us to forgive the person. God has helped me to forgive my husband for what had happened and the forgiveness process, it went on for a while. It's not an easy process, it takes time. But with God's help, and with the help of a counsellor uh, and looking to God's word, reading his word, prayer and friends about me, uh, the forgiveness began to take place. And it's interesting though, it didn't mean that I had to trust him again because my husband was not trustworthy and it was my children who pointed this out. When he came out of prison, they said, don't have him back so easily mum see if he's trustworthy and that's when i just really um, prayed about it and one of the ladies at church she gave me she was a counselor at the time she gave me a book to read called safe people and when i read that i thought no my husband is not safe and he hasn't been safe to me for many years i didn't recognize it how uh, he'd been towards me until all this had taken place and there were some things in my life that I needed to repent of as well which I did and the more that I opened up I even shared with my brother-in-law which shocked him some of it but I was able to share my own um, issues with sexual things and that because I'd been taken in with David to watch some porn but as well from my own background of living with an alcoholic father and introduced to sex stuff at an early age as well. So I had my own repentance. But God's brought about a real healing over the years, using uh, bringing to mind Bible verses and that. And one of the verses that came to my mind in the early days was Jeremiah um, I think it's 11.29, where he says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to hinder you, but to give you a hope and a future. And it was verses like this that I held to, and the other one, I think it's in Ezekiel, where he speaks of the years that the locusts have stolen. And I was able to take that verse and say, God, I know you're going to restore to me the years that uh, the evil one took away when he uh, allowed all this to happen were when my husband had made these poor choices in his life. And 
Yes, so that's when I knew that there would be healing in due time. But one of the pastors said to me, it's not going to happen overnight and we can't make it happen. It's a process that we have to walk through it. We have to walk through the situation with God at our side. And I wanted it just to be over and, you know, and I'd be this hunky-dory Christian. But no, there was a lot of chipping and, yeah, breaking of things, breaking off of uh, bad habits within myself. And not many people know this. I had a very bad habit of swearing when I was angry and my kids knew it. A lot of that he took, he's taken away. There might still be the occasional, but I'm well aware of things and I'm able to bring it to him. But anyway, during that time while David was in prison, God really upheld my family and I, and especially my son, Tim. He had a breakdown. He has autism. And to look at Tim today is just amazing. And that's through a lot of prayer and faith in God and believing that God would restore Tim. And I just liked, um, yeah, well, David did come out of prison. I didn't have him back. And then we sold the family house and I bought a home up in uh, Clavelli Park. And it's interesting how God provided that home too, because it wasn't till the last week before our settlement on the other house that that house come about. I needed a home that had the area for a, a baby grand piano, my daughter's piano, which her dad had bought her. And I thought, wow, uh, how are we gonna find a, a house that's small? Well, because I only wanted a smaller house because I knew it was only my daughter and I living in it. And, but God did provide. All the other homes didn't fit this piano didn't fit in them. It was the last house we look at, looked at and it was a house that was being shown before the actual open inspection. And I thought that was a real God thing. God had his hand on us from beginning to end. And when we were able to um, sell our own house with the help of many from my church and, yeah, just people helping clean and... Uh, get it ready for the open inspection and then selling it and buying the new house and moving in, I just think, wow, God really just blessed us. And there were many times when I saw God in, in my, uh, either in a vision or in a, a, the word while I was reading or songs that I was listening to. I was listening to a lot of songs at the time by Audio Adrenaline, uh, where he, the guy sings, I'd leave 99, leave this world behind to find you. And it really struck me that God had me and he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants us all to come to him. He wants us all to rely on him. And when all this took place, I said, God, I'm yours. Everything I have is yours. And that's when the doors just opened. He, he was, he's been so faithful to me. And yes, I can just see how he has been faithful to me. And it was after he came out uh, in 2016, well, before that, David came to me and asked for a divorce. I wasn't planning a divorce because I still believed that maybe we could get back together. But... In my quiet time that day, I was reading the Bible and a little voice in my head said, consider your marriage over. And I thought, pardon? I don't want my marriage to be over. But the voice came again and then I said, well, God, your will be done. And then I felt a real peace inside me. All the anxiety left me because I was praying that my husband would change and that we could have a, a relationship again, but really God had other ideas. And then an hour later, true to my word, my husband came in to my kitchen with the uh, divorce papers to sign. And I said to him, I said, I thought that you 
might change, David. I thought that you'd trust God and, uh, yeah, want to change. And he said, you can't change me, Alan. And that's when I remembered what God had said to me and I thought, wow, I think, I'll, and I said to, I just stood there and paused actually. And I said, Dave, I think I'll sign those papers. And I still said, God, you're bigger than divorce. You know, we could still get back together. But two years later, this was uh, what ended up happening. My husband had a, a psychotic episode where he thought he was being taken back into prison. And that night he um, took his own life. Well, he tried to take it, but it, he maimed himself into an unconscious state where he was on life support for a week. And then we had to make that decision, that tough decision to turn off the life support. And all the while, God was just bringing songs to my mind and verses to my mind to uphold us. And I could see God's hand and like his comfort and strength were just there. Even in that hard, difficult time of visiting him in the hospital and seeing him in ICU and then turning off the life support, I thought there was this incredible strength that I had that just upheld the children, upheld anyone who came in. And Anyway, and then four days later, on the 16th of January 2016, he passed away and one of our pastors was with him. And even this was a God thing because a missionary couple from India who David's dad had been supporting were over for a couple of weeks uh, visiting with Ted and we were at a family lunch and Pastor Joe said, I'll sit with David while you go to the lunch. And that's when David passed away with the pastor. And I thought, wow, he held on until the pastor was there, interesting. But really it was great because the family were all together when the news came through that he died and we could all cry together, we could all pray together. And we were, there was such a unity. And the pastor from India, he prayed for us all, uh, Pastor Timothy. And I, I just thought, wow God, you've done it again. You've just blown me away. The fact that this couple, Michelle and Timothy, were there you know at that time and I look back and think it's just incredible in fact I haven't told this story for so long but it's coming out but anyway um, yeah so but I can see that it was when my with my faith growing from 2007 onwards that prepared me to be able to cope with all that was coming. I didn't know what was coming. Without that faith, I could not have coped. I know I couldn't have coped and I couldn't cope today. I look at how I went to work and how I kept going and God just did it. He just did it. And even the ability, like I think of going over to the Philippines to Cebu in 2019 because i was meant to go in 2016 but in 2019 um, how he equipped me to uh, do the ministry there amongst the people there to give my testimony to a drug re um, a drug rehab of men called house of hope over there in cebu city and beautiful lot of men and their wives and families there, just beautiful, love Jesus. And they could testify as well how Jesus has helped them through their addictions and bringing them through to who they are today. And the other thing where God's leading me now is into a ministry with Prison Fellowship, something that I hadn't thought of doing. But last year I thought... Um, I wouldn't mind doing something with prison ministry. And I was talking to one of our elderly men at our church, a 96-year-old beautiful gentleman, 
And I said to him, I wouldn't mind doing some prison ministry. And he said, have you thought of prison fellowship, Alison? And I said, Doug, maybe that's something I could look at. Anyway, it took a few months. We procrastinate, you know, or we forget about it and move on a bit. But one day I was out with a friend, Jane and Michael, and we were chatting about where we're going in life and what we might do. And I said to them about the prison ministry. And I said, I guess I'd go with prison fellowship. And uh, Jane said, well, you've been talking about this for a while. How about I give you a week to ring them? So the next day, which was a Monday, I got on the phone and spoke to a beautiful man, Ian Townsend, and we uh, did some tra bit of training with three other ladies up in Port Augusta. We did it on Zoom meetings. And then I was able to go out at Christmas and deliver the uh, presents to families who had uh, their husband or partner, whoever, in prison. And just to see the children, their lot, you know, their faces lighting up as I gave out the gifts just was so precious. And I thought, wow, God, you're doing it again. He just, I think he wants to bless me in this way. I always thought I'd like to meet someone and marry again. And now I'm seeing that he's got other ideas in helping people and just bringing joy to people as well. And yeah, just doing his will in this way. <laughs> anyway, so... But even yesterday, like I went to the Soul Factor concert in town and there I was, I thought, I'm going to go for a walk. I love the streets of Adelaide. You always see a homeless person. And straight away, there's a man living on the streets in a little alleyway there. And I spoke with him. He was from the, uh, the Congo over in Africa. And he'd had his jaw broken, but it was had screws in it, like he'd had some surgery done. And I asked him if he'd like something to eat. I said, how about you come with me and we get something? And he said, no, I'm in too much pain. So I said, I'll go and find something for you. And I thought, where am I going to find something here? Because it was the east end of Perry Street. I thought I'd have to walk quite a way. He probably won't think I'm coming back. But anyway, just up the street, not far, was a restaurant on the corner. So in I went and I was able to get him some soft food, some ice cream actually, takeaway ice cream. They usually don't do it. But anyway, they gave me some ice cream and he was delighted to have that. But what blew me away next was the lady and her daughter that turned up with their bag in tow with goods in it, like food and some antibiotics and water to give to this man and it was his doctor from Flinders Medical Centre who'd seen him uh, just before, after the concert and she went out and bought him something and I thought, wow, this is another God thing and this is what I see in my life. I think my eyes were opened, like God's used the situation of my husband going into prison, all that we went through and now my eyes are open to see some beautiful things which go on. We hear so much rubbish on the news. We hear negative things all the time. But to see the beautiful things happening around with people who know and love God and who just want to give their all for Jesus and how they're reaching out to people and just bringing about that healing in people's lives through Jesus' power, and it just really thrills me. And that's what I, when I was a nurse, that was the case, but now I'm working as a support worker in the homes of people with disability, and I'm seeing that there are opportunities there to share Jesus, but to just be a quiet witness and to love people where they're at. And that would be the main thing that I've learned to, um, to love, to care and to forgive people, but also to self-care. I think that was a biggie, to self-care. 
to have that massage, uh, to have that time out. And I really love the beach and that's where God meets me, down at the beach. He always has. And I remember a night when David was in prison and one night I said to the kids, I've just got to go down to the beach. And they said, fine, because they were watching their telly and, you know, on their phones or whatever. So off I went and God just really spoke to me. He said, I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I believe those verses in the Bible and I believe them to this day, no matter what. And I know that he's got a place for me set apart in heaven when I die. And I'm just so grateful for what he's done in my life and he's still doing. And I can tell you listeners that he will do it for you if you put your faith and trust in him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, for sharing that. That's an amazing uh, testimony there and uh, they're very touching. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad that you got through it. There's a lot, a lot there. Well, there was. And like I say, yeah, just my faith in God and I can see how he did build me up from 2007 because I needed to be. But I didn't know that. I just followed his lead of, yeah. And I remember a time in, yeah, it was early, yeah, when we make our resolutions on um, yes. New Year's Day and that. I just prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, if there's anything in my life or in my home that needs to go, please take it. And the pastor's wife said to me, wow, you never pray those prayers. Look, he took your husband, I said. If that's what he had to take, that's what he had to take. As hard as it was, you know, right. Yeah, and, and Ryan, you yeah. were just saying earlier about uh, Luke 15. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's an amazing uh, experience to hear, well, first of all, Alison's story. There's a lot of courage there. And when, you know, we were chatting briefly, Bianca, about having this story, there's so much about God's timing of redemption. I mean, think yes, about it. Uh, so Alison's husband chose, made different choices that led him in a destructive path, but choosing unto life is what Alison did and God preserved her. And now she's gone back to minister to people in prison. And now she's sharing her story to the world through that microphone. <laughs> That's an amazing story of redemption. And this week is all about redemption as well because we've got Resurrection Sunday. This coming Sunday, we'll call it Easter. Mm -hmm. But this is where Luke 15 comes in. Uh, God is all about wanting to have a relationship with us. Uh, we cannot survive just on religiosity alone because you could be in church and have problems, but it's a relationship. So Luke 15, or in a nutshell, it's basically how God tells three stories about a shepherd who, who leaves the 99 to go and look for the one lost sheep. All right, he, he a 99 sheep that's doing well, he's not satisfied with that, he'll go hunt down the one that might be lost in a crazy cliff because he wants commu communion and connection again. That's the most precious thing we find. Then he goes to a story, a lady loses one coin out of 10. She got nine shiny coins on the table she can see, but the one lost in the dust She's not satisfied. She wants to be reconnected to the coin. And then lastly, one son out of two. Uh, the father who had two sons. And the one son said, hey, give me all your money. I want to go party. And I guess anytime you give resources to immaturity, I guess you have riotous living. But that aside, he made a mess. But as soon as he said, I'm going to go back, the father embraced him. He didn't, he didn't say, hey, you wasted my money or you didn't do this. All God wanted to illustrate is that he wants a relationship with you more than your sense of perfection. I've crossed every, I keep messing, crossed every T, dot every I. Actually, he just wants to have a relationship with you. So that's Luke 15 and that ties in. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, absolutely. 
Now, I'll just uh, intercept just briefly for a moment because Alison, you did say, oh, I'm, I'm just looking at the time you said you needed to go at four. I mean, I'd love to have you longer, but I don't, I don't want you to be rushing on those roads or anything, but you're welcome to stay if you, if you want, but anything else you want to share or anything else you want to say? And well, I'd just you like to here. thank you for having me. It's been really good to be able to share this. I never thought I would on, ra <laughs> on radio, but thank you for having me here. And I just hope that people will um, listen to, especially what Ryan said, God does seek out the lost and we've all been lost, like away from God, but he really wants to seek us out and have that relationship with us. And this is a good time of year to do that at Easter when he did give his life for us and yeah, he died for our sins and he really um, forgives us our sins when we come to him and we just confess those, all those things that we've done wrong and all the sin and the shame that we've got. And he can take that guilt and that shame away from us and just give us a beautiful relationship with him that leads to eternal life and ultimately. So thank you again. Thank and, you. Yeah. Thank you God so bless. much. God bless everyone. Thank you. Bless you God thank bless you, you Alison. Thank you so much. Have a safe trip. We do. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ryan. Have you had? Maybe, maybe this is a good time to have a little song. Okay. Do. What do you think? Hey, let's do a song. Let's do a song. That was just so great hearing your story. So thank you for that. Thank you. We'll see you again. Thank, thank you. you. See you. intro. This song is called Jaira. All right. It's a song, I guess, might be known in Christian circles, but Jaira means provider. It's the name of God, Jehovah Jaira, the Lord, the provider. So here we go.
and we'll come back for part two in a moment. Part two coming up.